So I decided that I wanted to, to merge my two. And I decided that uh, going to journalism school and getting a master's was the way to do that. So I came here in the 70s, and, and I pulled this from the site at, uh, at the university. And you can see that a big thing happened in 1970. It was before I came, but it gives you an idea of like, the timeline that I was here. They began to use two-way radio communications here at the Missouri. And so they were really humming. I went on to, uh, to work at the Miami Herald. I was there for three years, and, and it dates me when I tell you they were using a, a rotogravure press. They were still melting lead, and the presses uh, made this, the building shake. After three years there, I decided that I really wanted to work for magazines, and I took a big leap of faith and quit the paper and went to New York and started to, uh, to make the rounds with my portfolio. And I was lucky enough to get some good early assignments that sort of launched my freelance career. And during that time, which was the 80s, I started to use computers. And I'm not talking about the computers we have today. I'm talking about 25 years ago when Tandy made a little laptop. And I actually, believe it or not, bought this 20-some uh, pound crazy K-Pro portable is what they were calling it at the time. And it did not fit under the seat in airplanes. And of course, um, from there, I, um, I really didn't think that there was going to be that much you could do with computers except expense accounts and, and maybe a, you know, address books and things like that. But I was wrong. I went to a, a trade show in Washington, DC. And uh, this is actually uh, where I went. They imploded the convention center that this trade show was in in 2005. But at that trade show, I saw this guy who was hawking Adobe Photoshop 1.0. I think the software at that time was only about two weeks old. And I thought, oh, I got to listen to this. And I sat there and watched him take a computer that looked pretty much like this one. And he took one piece of a picture and put it in another picture. And it was like this magical thing had happened. And I was all of a sudden in real awe of the power of this machine. And for the first time, I thought, well, I really need to understand it. So I stayed around. And I said to the guy, I hope you don't mind me sounding too ignorant, but how does it do that? And he actually was very generous and pleasant. And, and he gave me a, 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 a primer on bits and bytes. And he explained to me, and this is 1991, how a hard drive worked and how software like Adobe was actually doing calculations in split second times. And I got it. I got that this thing was powerful. And as I was going up the escalator, of this big convention center, I had this weird, amazing epiphany that my whole being of a communicator was changing. And that what I did fundamentally, which was to tell stories, was going to totally be different in the future. But I didn't know how. So at the time, I was also coincidentally working on a National Geographic story on um, recycling. And it took me all over the country. I could plan my trip. And thus, I could call ahead to companies that might be working with technology in all these different cities across America where I was supposed to be doing recycling photography. And I said to them, my name's Jose Azel. I'm a photographer with National Geographic. And I'm coming into your town. And I'd like to talk to you about how technology is going to affect my world. And I think all they heard was, oh, National Geographic wants to talk to me. So it didn't matter who I called. They all said, yes, come right over. Took me out to lunch, took me out for drinks, gave me tours of their facilities. And I began to question them on what they were doing. And I began to piecemeal together what had yet to really become big news in America, which was there, the, that we were on the edge of this technology revolution, this amazing revolution that today every single person 
in, in the world pretty much knows about it. And I came back from that all psyched and saying to myself, okay, my photo agency has to get into this revolution thing because it's going to be big. And I couldn't convince them. They had no clue. They, they thought I was talking some foreign language. So I was naive enough to start my own company. And I called it Aurora for the goddess of dawn, which was the traditional way of seeing light. And I called it Quanta for the way that quantum physicists call a packet of light when it, when, uh, for light when it acts like a particle. And that's called a packet of light as Quanta. And thus Aurora and Quanta Productions was born in 1993. The idea was that we were going to have a traditional photo agency and that we were going to get going with that and about a year later we were going to hire some really smart young guy and we were going to invent whatever new media was going to be. I didn't know what it was going to be, but we were going to invent it. So we did that. And I actually had some interesting successes. We did some projects about a year and a half after Aurora and Quanta was, was um, born on different kinds of ways to present imagery. Uh, this one was one of the early projects. And I'm very remiss that I was so ignorant as to not to archive things and, and keep updating some of the versions of the things we did because Today, there's very little that I can actually physically show you of those early days because of my ignorance and understanding that it might have been cool to archive them in some way. So uh, Photo Voyages was with the Washington Post newspaper, and the idea was that there was a bunch of photography that told a story and that we initially had been telling it in a linear way, but we wanted to give users the potential to go through it in an interactive way. So we put together every week a new story out of our archive. Eventually, it became something like 28 or 30 stories. And when you launched the story, you would get a set of images. And you would then pick the one that you wanted to start your voyage on. In this case, I've got a, a graphic here of the rice story, you know, the world of um, rice, the world's food. and then it would launch you into your story and you could follow it under the thread of the picture that you chose. In this case, it might have been something like uh, the growers of rice, but then as you can see up on the left-hand side, you could have other subcategories of this story so that people could actually wander through the story through their own interests. We also did some other things um, for Apple Computer, one of, the, one of the companies I went to see when I did my kind of national uh, tour of the, of, the, of the country and what people were doing was to visit Apple. And I got to know some of the people doing work there. And one of them had been working on a secret project, which was eventually to be QTVR, 360 degree panoramic photography. And um, I have to actually, I don't know how to get to QTVR from here, so I'm going to escape out of this program for a second. And I'm going to show you, hey, here we go. I'm going to show you just an idea of what we did, because I don't really have this project. But the project was a virtual tour of Central Park. And this was the initial menu screen that you could go all the way around. And you could enter in different ways to get different things. And this one took you into the park. And you found yourself on Fifth Avenue, just outside the park. And up here, you could see that there's, there's see how the, the cursor changes? That means that you could click up there so you could go to the top of that building. Or you see the cursor changed here. You could enter the park. And we created a, uh, a virtual tour of the park, allowing you to go down different paths. And in each one of these 360 degree panoramics, there were hotspots that you could click on, which at this point you can't really go to because the actual thing we built is not together, but it gives you an idea. And you would go and actually see a mini little photo story. Um, maybe in this case, it was ducks in the pond 
and people feeding the ducks. In others, you might see a homeless person. In others, you might see um, a rollerblader. And you could just do that for about, I think it was nine or 10 nodes. We called those individual QTVR nodes and they were all interconnected. So it was kind of a fun, a fun time to play with all of this stuff. But we didn't make any real money at it. We, um, we worked for a lot of the magazines and companies that were really the big names of the day. And, and the reason I think it didn't work has something to do with, with what I actually would want you to think about just now. You just saw a lot of the Time Warner publications come up on the screen. And the internet bubble at that time was starting to you know, expand and expand and expand. It hadn't quite popped yet. And, and make pretend you were one of the executives at Time Warner and, and you got to be up on the 36th floor and you had this most beautiful boardroom where people gathered and you made these giant decisions about your company. And you knew that this big giant internet thing was going to be huge and that you had to be in it. And what would you do? If you had been in that boardroom when they were making these decisions about your magazines and the internet? Well, I have a feeling you would not have done what they did. What they did is they decided that they come up with this great new name called Pathfinder. And they would brand this whole new thing under that name. And all those magazines that had decades of history and tradition and brand identity all got buried under Pathfinder. And I realized as I saw this happening before me, and I guarantee you, I had actually spoken to the editors of some of those publications, the Fortunes and the Times. We had actually worked with Time Magazine. Aurora and Quanta had been the first company to license QTVR from Apple and relicense it to Time. And we told a small story about the, um, the um, what's baseball? The World Series. We told us, yeah, you're a baseball guy. Come on, you know. World Series. We did QTVR in the in the photography uh, third baseman side, and and you actually were the photographer, and you could look around, and then you could click on things, and different things would happen that happened during that game that night, and people could download it the next day when they read the sports section of Time hidden way deep inside Pathfinder. And I told some of these editors, this is nuts, I don't get it. I mean, how are, you, how are you hiding some of the most amazing brands in the world? But what happened to me as, a, as somebody who was beginning to learn business was I realized the people I was trying to work for were my worst enemy. And that the internet bubble by this point was now bursting and I saw that the only way to compete in this industry was to go and get venture capital because on the side what we'd been doing to try to make money is we'd been building websites for corporate clients and I had no passion for that even though we had made good money with it and even though it was to some degree exciting it took me totally away from the photo part of what we were trying to do and what we were trying to do in new media with photography was going nowhere. So I concentrated on going to um, just what Aurora has become today, which is a photography company. And I did that from, um, I'd say, late 90s through about three years ago when we decided to also do Novus Select, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But basically, we evolved into a stock agency more than anything else. We archived the photography of about 300 photographers from all over the world. Most of them are US based, but we have a, a fairly good crew of international photographers. You must all know the basics of stock. People can search our site. We license pictures. Historically, it's been rights managed photography. Now it's also 
royalty-free photography because more than half of all the licensing that happens in the world today is royalty-free. So you really have to go with what the clients and the market dictate. We're still, to some degree, trying to be innovative within Aurora Photos. We launched a, a phone collection, a My Phone collection, and this was our answer to being agnostic to whether you were a professional or not a professional. Anybody can come to the site, sign up to be a contributor of My Phone collection. We still curate, we don't accept every image, but we allow anybody who wants to, to submit. It's pretty easy to do once you've signed the contract. You can just email us a photo from your phone. Most people use an application to make the picture look cool. We've archived over the years, I think over 2,000 uh, stories or essays. Way back in the beginning, which was um, 18 years ago, well, 19 years next month, uh, we, we were actually licensing the stories. There was a market, a, a fairly decent market for photo essays, and today that market has shrunk incredibly, and in America it's almost non-existent when you think about all the essays that are in a magazine or in magazines today. But we have kept up with this because we realized over time that a lot of our clients are people who love to see these stories, so we end up really doing it almost as a marketing play. And editors will come to see what new stories we have. And by coming to see us on the site, then they remember we're around and they license single pictures. And as I said, we have over 2,000 of them. And they range in all kinds of uh, categories. And then about three years ago, we uh, founded or, or began a new company which initially was called Select and another company was called Novus, but we've merged them in the last year and, and Novus Select today basically works with photographers to uh, get them assignments and commissioned work. We have um, a lot of outdoor adventure photographers. We have people who do portraits. We have people from all over the world right now that are part of our assignment network. And then we have Novus Select, which is going through a site redesign but basically what happened there was that we, we made about half a dozen to, to a dozen or so uh, prototypes of the kinds of stories we wanted to do. We launched Novus and we took it out to the client base. We showed magazines, we showed companies, and it resonated a lot more with companies than it did with magazines. Not that magazines didn't like what we were doing, they liked what we were doing, but they were telling us that they had no money to really fund it at the level that we thought that we needed to, to make money on. So we began to take corporate assignments and it's the corporate assignment marketplace for what is called multimedia that has helped fuel the growth of Novus. But I've always kept a, a point of view that at some point, you know, we're gonna come back and we're gonna circle back around to the editorial part of storytelling and do that as well. I'm just gonna give you a little example of something that Novus did for Aurora Photos as a little marketing piece that we show clients re around our uh, travel photography.
So one of the, the reasons that I think we're still around is because we've tried hard to maintain the quality bar of the imagery very high. And, um, and that gives you kind of a, a, a taste of where I've been and what we've been doing with, with Aurora, Photos, Novus, and Select. And, and what I thought I would do for the rest of my presentation is talk a little bit about you know, what I think needs to be happening going forward and, and kind of bring in a lot of different things together and maybe get people to start thinking a little bit about some of the things that you'll, you'll hear about. And I hope we have time to actually have a little bit more of a conversation around it as a group, not necessarily just a Q&A. To do that, let's start with a, a really quick kind of photo industry timeline here. So photography started in the late 1800s. Stock agencies began in like 1920. Western Union transmitted a half-tone photo in 21. AT&T followed. Then AP decided that they would start a wire photo service in 1935. We have the golden age of photojournalism with magazines and newspapers all over the world using photography in, in amazing ways. Magnum Photos is founded in the late 40s. NPPA was founded also in the 40s. Tony Stone begins uh, a whole new licensing model for photography that was already shot. And he was revolutionary in, in that way in the stock industry in the 60s. Technology begins to, to really come into the, the camera around then. In 74, the Image Bank takes their brand worldwide with 71 offices all over. In the 80s, stock becomes especially in its own right, and there's photographers who actually do nothing but stock photography. And of course, this is coming a little bit from my filtered perspective of being in the stock world. Uh, Photo Disc is founded in 1991, which actually is using royalty free by sending CD ROMs to clients. Photo CD system from Kodak in 92 is, is, uh, is born. We know that didn't go very far. Um, businesses begin to see the internet as a major distribution method in the 90s. Time Magazine becomes the first magazine to license Apple QTVR and put it on the web. Tony Stone gets bought by a company that realizes that they can actually take what has been a, a very broad range of companies over maybe thousands of stock agencies and begin to consolidate them into one big giant behemoth. They start with the Tony Stone acquisition. I think to date they've acquired about 149 agencies. Um, Corbus becomes the second biggest player. Uh, a guy named Bruce Livingston creates iStock, which was the first what we now call micro stock that sells for a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars a license. Google begins to do searching images on the on the internet in 2001. Scoop starts a citizens journalism um, company. Eventually it gets bought by Getty. In 2006, social networking begins to gain momentum. Anybody over the age of 13 can now become a Facebook user. In 2009, there's a decline of 41% in, ad in ads for 428 magazines. In 2010, the, the Columbia Photojournalism Review um, says that magazine subscriptions and circulation drops between 60 and 75% for most of the big magazines. And a little bit more of the negative comes from the president of ASMP, a professional organization that has 6,000 photographer members and 39 chapters. And he begins to claim that it's so much more now about the quantity and the speed and the price and not the quality of the photography. Richard Lords, a stock shooter that 
that has had over 45,000 images in circulation in 74 countries agrees that it's really not about the quality of the image anymore. And all you need to do is go to Google where you can see that Ansel Adams could shoot a picture like this at a time when very few people could do it. And today, that very same scene exists probably dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And while the image might not be exactly the, the, the best or exactly the same, it definitely is an image that somebody's gonna buy or license for maybe almost nothing. And some of them, you have to admit, are pretty amazing and pretty good. So clearly there's been a shift. We all can recognize that, but in this, some of it can be seen as positive. You have the growth of broadband. You know, we've got a, a graph here that shows internet users in the global population, and you see that now there's a huge number of internet users globally. Bandwidth begins to grow. This was one of the issues that we had back when we were trying to do our experiments in the early 90s with Aurora Quanta. The bandwidth was just a little bit too small. Facebook, of course, is a phenomenon we're all very familiar with, with 845 million members. And what it does, it begs the question, who is the audience? And while I believe that the single image is still important and the future does belong to storytellers, visual storytellers more specifically, you know, what do we do with old storytellers like me who grew up in an older world? We've seen that the way we used to function was a one-to-one -one type of communication or a one-to-many communication, but that's changed. This, um, this wild graphic shows the internet and all the different nodes and how they talk to each other, and it really has become a place where anybody can talk to anybody. Michael Wolf from uh, Vanity Fair has written for business and internet issues that digital behavior theory is that old media businesses impose an, an unnatural behavior on its users. He claims that the traditional media, there's a strict divide, divide between the creator and the audience. Old media just doesn't get it. Clay Shirsky, a professor at NYU, studies the interrelated effects of social and technology networks, and he points out that each participant in the group can also become a producer by actively publishing their views. He claims that social media has paralyzed mass media into confusion, fear, ignorance. And Brian Saltzus, another social scientist, supports his comments. He writes, it's no longer an isolated or individual experience. We are connected to one another based on common interests. I think that's an important point. We have very specific interests, each and every one of us. And we have now the ability to plug into social networks. Television is going through a very similar transition period. And there was a conference just, um, I think it was last month or the month before in New York called the TV and Everything Video Forum presented by the Association of National Advertisers. And this conference was sponsored by Google, who owns YouTube. The message was this, that TV today is not, like, not unlike it was six de decades ago. It's really the beginning of the future. Second screens are changing the viewer experience. Samson Electronics is gonna be making some huge investments, I mean mega investments in how they will bring screens and, and their suite of products into the living room. It's something that's been talked about for a while, but it's finally gonna be coming. And Chris Robinson, Senior Director of Product Management at Adobe System says, the the consumers are adapting these second screens on laptops, on video, on uh, iPhones, on, on pads, 
faster than, than, the, um, than the, the traditional businesses can provide them. So we are the participants. We're no longer just the people who are in the offices deciding what to feed the masses. There's really going to be much more than that. It's going to be a, a many-to-many -many discussion. And what I think that means is that we need to focus on communities. I think we need to start thinking about the fact that it's already been demonstrated. Mobile devices can be targeted. A National Geographic photographer can start a magazine. We have a, a seen Brian's you know, publishing empire begin to unfold. There's really an amazing thing that's going on and where do we fit in? And what I think I realize is that we fit in as storytellers, not so much as, as one specific storyteller, but I think as a director, I think we need to think, our, think of ourselves as, as people who, who aren't necessarily gonna go out into the field and tell the story, but be the ones that lead a team that tells the story. While single images and photo essays are not dead and story, but even though they're not dead, storytelling has changed and it's gonna to continue to evolve. And we need to be the people who drive that change. I definitely don't espouse to one man band type situations. I think that the best advice I can give people is to start to look beyond your own world for collaborators. Multimedia is a poor, a poor word at best for this next frontier of, of what we're gonna be doing. It has a lot of layers and complexity and it can follow dozens of paths. Robert Gilka, who was the legendary hard-ass director of the National Geographic magazine, used to say, I'm up to my ears in photographers, but only knee-deep in good ideas. I think it begins with that idea, and I think it begins with, with the person who can then lead that idea within a team. And one of the things that I would very much like to see would, would potentially answer the question of how do we do it? And I, as I said at the beginning, I don't feel I have the answer, but I think I have a suggestion that can maybe begin to lead to an answer. And I think it's, let's start with a white, with a blank whiteboard. Let's look at what's changed. I just went through a few points, and what I think has happened is we have technology advances. We have um, amazing new tools and technology with our cameras. We have frictionless delivery systems. We have social communities now that we can get on to and have our ideas disseminated by interests. We have the ability to, to mix media in ways that we never had before. We should look at what our strengths are. Well, one of them is that we're journalists. And by being good journalists, then we should be able to identify what good stories are. As individuals, we are all gonna come to this with one probably strong specialty. And what is it that we're gonna to wanna to create? I think we're gonna to wanna to create something that's not television. And I think we're gonna to wanna to create something that's not print, nor do we want it to reproduce radio. We want something that takes all of these things and puts them together in some new way. There are a couple of key elements that I've seen as, as we've worked with the, the very kind of simple productions that we do that that can come about. One is team dynamics. I think it's really important to understand who your team is and, and how you should make up that team. And I think the other one is process. I think there's a process for how new stories and new ways of telling stories are gonna evolve and we need to work harder at figuring out what those processes are. It's tough to break out of the groove, you know, when you've worked in, in one industry for decades if you've been working on a paper and putting that out in a certain way, if you've been working for a TV station, how do you shift? You know, how do you do something that's different? There's a little, um, there's a little story I want to tell about 
the MIT Building 20. Does anybody know about Building 20? Building 20 started uh, after or around the war with a 250,000 square foot, three floor building off the MIT campus. Initially, it was regarded as a failure. Ventilation was poor. The hallways were dim. But after the war, it became um, slated for demolition. But as they needed more space and it was going to take too much time to build new places, they decided to make it um, the Rad Lab offices. And, and they started putting in more and more different types of research people in that building and, and filling it up. The GI Bill suddenly left uh, MIT with the needed space and, and the building was readily available. So it became this very strange, eclectic mix of research that was going on there. And because there was no real design for the building, then it kind of became an incubator. Uh, Jonathan Leher writes in The New Yorker, Building 20 became a strange, chaotic domain full of groups who had been thrown together by chance and who knew little about one another's work. And yet, by the time it was finally demolished in 1998, Building 20 had become a legend of innovation, widely regarded as one of the most creative spaces in the world. In the post-war decade, scientists working, um, working through stunning, scientists worked through stunning advances there in high-speed photography, the development of physics behind microwaves. Building 20 served as an incubator for Boss the sound company. It gave rise to the first video games. They studied Chomsikian linguistics there. Uh, Stuart Brand, in his studies of how buildings learn, cited Building 20 as an example of the low road structure, a type of space that is usually creative because it's so unwanted and underdesigned. So it actually kind of began to be studied as a way to design new buildings. Um, it, I mean, I can't say enough about what I feel I learned from this little mini story of Building 20, which is that a lot of people who normally would have not had contact with each other got thrown together into this bizarre building where one scientist decided he couldn't fit his equipment in the building and didn't even ask for, um, for permission to take the floor out of two stories so that his big giant scientific machine could fit in this three-story building. That's the kind of place it was. And it spurned all this innovation because of it. And the people who worked there later remarked on that. And I think we need to, to think about how we can move towards something like that. You know, Brian talked a little bit about the iPad, and I agree. You know, we, the iPad comes out, and everybody starts talking about whether the iPad's going to be a savior, you know? The iPad is not going to be the savior. The savior really needs to come from creativity. And if, and if you espouse to what I do, which is that I do believe that there's a new medium that we can actually invent, then, then I think you'll agree it's not going to be about the iPad, though that kind of technology makes it possible. Um, there are people that say the same thing. You know, the, the, final, the final word is basically that, that we don't know. No person has the answer. You know, what, we, what I think we, f we need is, is a well-funded attempts to do R&D. I'm a very big proponent of that. And I think that if Time Warner, for example, to go back to Pathfinder, had taken on a whole different perspective and had said to each one of those editors, we're not going to put millions and millions of dollars into trying to rebrand and create some new internet site. We're going to actually take some of this money and give it to you guys. Because the other thing that happened is that when they decided to do Pathfinder, they saw it as a different business model. So the, the people working at Time or at Fortune or at Life didn't see it as inclusive. The mandate was, oh, and let the people running the website do what they want with your content. Instead of doing that kind of expenditure, I would have said, empower those editors, you know, give them money, bring in new people, and have them experiment. Have them go out, have no timeline, have no deadline, and produce new work, work that starts with that blank whiteboard. 
I want to talk about that if you guys want to talk about that. So I'm going to leave you with just three more little show and tell videos that, that we've done at, um, at Nova Select. And, and then we'll open it up to, I hope, what can be a discussion. having this totally carefree life to having this big responsibility now. My name is Jesse Stone. I am a medical doctor and a whitewater kayaker and I run a nonprofit organization called Soft Power Health. When I first came to Uganda, I was a full-time kayaker and that was my life. One of my sponsorship opportunities was paddling for wave sport and Eric Jackson, EJ, was designing boats for wave sport. EJ said, we're gonna do a trip to the Nile. You know, we've been warned about how bad the malaria problem was here. Sure enough, shortly after we got here, EJ came down with malaria. He's been taking prophylaxis, he's been sleeping under a mosquito net. How did this happen? And if he got it, what about all the local people here? My curiosity was really piqued. I went through the village and made a 50 hut survey. The answers were really stunning because nobody had a mosquito net, not one single person we interviewed. Everyone reported at least one child dying in their households from malaria and everybody wanted more information and lastly, they all wanted to buy a mosquito net. community here asked me one day, would you like to build us a clinic? I really knew nothing about it, absolutely nothing about it. Subsequently, I went back to New York, where my parents live, and we raised $25,000. That money was enough to totally build our clinic. We see everything from little teeny tiny babies who have severe malaria to people with advanced cancers, people with severe hypertension, diabetes, you name it. All of a sudden, this need developed in the community for family planning. Uganda has one of the highest birth rates in Africa. We discovered that people really didn't know anything about conception or contraception. Now, our family planning outreach is even more popular than the malaria outreach. I mean, people are dying for this information. We have three outreaches every week that go out into the community and educate people about family planning and then actually offer short-term and intermediate-term methods of family planning right then and there in the community. <laughs> At the moment in time when I came to Uganda for this kayaking mission, I was also ready for something else to change in my life, you know, to add something to the kayaking because it had been like full time, nothing but kayaking for a number of years. You know, kayaking has really become much more of my stress reliever, uh, escape, if you will, back into a world of a lot less responsibility than this other responsibility that I've taken on myself with starting Soft Power Health and running the clinic and the outreach programs. People always say to me, oh, so when this part of the river is a lake, you're just gonna move, right? You're gonna leave, you're gonna stop? And I'm like, no. You know, this, this project, we're totally invested in this project and would like it to continue as long as the need is there. I am hopeful about working here because I've seen all the progress that we've made with interventions that we've done this far, which have helped many, many people. I really believe that even if you're helping to make one person's life better, if they can then take care of themselves better, you've made a big difference.
This is a, um, a thing we did for Apple. Twenty-five years ago, I saw an opportunity to provide assistance services to boaters in the Rhode Island area. Customers contact us when they have a problem on the water. Today, we operate a fleet of six state-of-the-art, high-tech rescue towboats. We make the same kind of investment in our technology products, like the iPhone and the iPad, because in the end, we're really in the problem-solving business. The more information we have about a situation and a customer, the easier we can come up with a solution iPad allows us to have access to that information no matter where we are. I never know what's going to come to me until the job hits me. That really is the nature of the business. The iPad was something we had waited years for. We have the ability to go anywhere, be anywhere, doing anything. The iPhone and the iPad gives us a direct connection to the people that need us for help. When a call comes into our dispatch center, the on-duty dispatcher takes the information from the customer, location, what the problem is, where they need to go and they enter that directly into our custom FileMaker solution. FileMaker Go has enabled us to go entirely paperless. When the customer signs off, the digital capture of his signature goes into a database. So we're going from maybe six or seven pieces of paper per job to absolutely none. There's a ton of iPad and iPhone apps that give us maritime information that's critical for our captains. When we're on an operation, it's important to know what the tide's doing, whether it's rising or falling and how high it's going to be. We use Tidegraph HD on our iPads to get that information. By using the buoy data app, I have access to the weather conditions where my customers are. I know immediately upon looking at it exactly what they're facing and exactly what I have to go through to get there. The weather bug app, it's a one-stop shop for any weather conditions we need. Everything is on one screen. So what these apps have done is taken everything that we had in varying areas and moved them all onto one device. Being that far ahead technologically allows us to be a much more efficient company. In our business, there isn't any room for mistakes. When we get the call, we need to be there, we need to respond, and we need to do it right. I can instantly look at my iPad, get on the boat, go to exactly where I need to go. I know who I'm going for, what their problem is, and it makes us much more efficient. This job is about finesse and having the right equipment to do it. I have everything I need right here on my iPad. So that's what pays the bills. Uh, telling stories for other people. And uh, the nice thing about working with Apple is that when we started to do these kind of things a couple of years ago, they actually had been doing them with video. And they asked us if we thought we could do something that would be video-like, but be with stills. So it, it was a kind of an interesting way to start this kind of storytelling. But we've learned a lot uh, about that. Now, I don't know, do we have time for some back and forth? or? So, um, you know, you can ask me a question or, or better yet, I would rather he hear from any of you who think that, um, that perhaps we need some, some kind of out-of-the-box thinking and, and putting teams together from different disciplines in a, in a room and give them the task to go and experiment and, and make that kind of an effort, a more concerted way to step forward into storytelling in the future. But either way, whatever you guys would like. Well, I have a question um, regarding bringing people from different disciplines together. And um, it sounds like you have some experience with that. So I'm just curious about the sort of culture of communication across disciplines. And if you found sort of some helpful rules of thumb about how to help people who have different cultures and different jargons um, communicate effectively with one another? Well, usually what I found is that as you, as you look for who those people might be, you find a commonality, which is kind of what's happened in my own journey. When I ended up um, being shown around the Apple campus and got put together with several people, there was one very specific connection that was made with one of the, the engineers that was working on a project there because he had a love of photography. So here he is talking to a National Geographic photographer. And I think if you find that common thread, then you have people that are gonna be, you know, very excited about working together. So my advice would be when you're trying to put together that team, 
look for what that commonality might be. All right, well. Well, thank you, Jose, very thank much. Thank you.